Scripture reading this morning comes to us from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2 and verse 26. For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, while to the sinner he has given the task of gathering and collector, collecting, so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after wind. Certainly want to welcome everyone to our services here at the Freetown Road Church of Christ in Grand Prairie, Texas. Uh, those that are visiting here in person, you are our honored guest, and we're very thankful that you have taken the opportunity to be here. We want you to know if this is your first time that we do our best to speak where the Bible speaks and are silent where the Bible is silent. Uh, we are just men and women, but we serve a great God. And being a, a visitor, we'd like you to know if you do not have a Bible in your own home, then as you exit the auditorium, you'll see a bookshelf there with different translations. Please take one of those with our compliments because while we do try to speak where the Bible speaks, there's nothing like having the Word of God at your fingertips to be able to read for yourself and to study for yourself. Don't ever take man's word for it. Take God's word to the bank. I'm certainly thankful, though, for you being here. You know, there's a lot of misery in the world. A lot of misery. Uh, and I'm sure that's nothing new to anyone here. Uh, you know, going through several different websites uh, of news organizations just this last week, a couple of the headlines that I saw were, the COVID variant is more contagious, associated with higher risk of death, and now the most common strain in the U.S., the CDC says. Another one was China surrounds Taiwan in military show of force. Uh, CNN had one article that began, the bloodbath is coming, more people will die. These are just the headlines. Another headline, this one from Fox News, said two Seattle schools inundated with homeless encampments. Another reported millions of gallons of toxic water shuttering California's beaches, the report says. And this will be the last one. Biden versus Iran. Nuclear talks should worry U.S. and allies. Now those are just a few of the many, many headlines found in just a six-hour news cycle. So in the course of six hours, I just kind of checked a few different websites, you know, news websites throughout the day, not even over the week or even 24 hours, just six hours. And those were some of the headlines. And there were plenty more that I weeded out. And according to a journalistic review, approximately 90% of all media news is negative. 90%. 65% of news organizations ignore mistakes. And an average of 79% of media companies print biased stories for advertisers. Now, that is from a board of journalists. It's not a third party. These are journalists who did a report on themselves and they admit that the news that we read is geared toward the cynical and is often more motivated by money. And in that same review, they said that around 26.7% of people that are exposed to negative news that they go on to develop anxiety. And it can get to the point where people actually need to be on medication. In fact, there was uh, the Russian news website, The City Reporter. They decided to test it out, and they decided to publish only positive stories for a day. Okay, a single 24-hour news cycle. In the social experiment, it was undertaken to see the effect of negative news versus positive news and what it would have on the people. So they wrote all of their, all of their news stories for 24 hours from a positive stance. And guess what? You never guess what happened. They, well, you probably will. They lost 66% of their readership when they decided to focus just on positive stories. It wasn't that it wasn't news, and I'm not saying that they, all they did was cover, you know, uh, puppies and flowers, but they covered news from a positive standpoint, and they lost 66% of their readers. And it can be challenging, especially as a Christian to maintain a positive outlook. 
when 90% of the news that we read, whether it's news websites, whether it's social media, whether it's the print ads or listening to it on the radio, it can be difficult as a Christian to maintain a positive outlook when 90% of what we get is negative and cynical. When it's motivated by money. And when there could be mistakes and the news organization, whomever it is, isn't looking at printing a retraction. Because after all, no matter how often or how much we may read our Bible, no matter how many countless hours we spend in prayer, there's misery in every direction, from politics to our schools, from the military to our environment. Though one may be a Christian, that doesn't mean that we're immune to depression, thoughts of suicide, fits of anger or rage. A lot of the times we push those things out and say, no, Christians can't be depressed. They don't deal with that. Christians don't deal with suicidal thoughts and anything. Yeah, we push those, those things out. But people are pretty much the same all over the world. And that's why this morning I want us to consider the happy life. And where we can find it. As you can see, this is just part one. Well, we're going to go through seven of them this morning very quickly. And then next week we'll have another seven to add to it. So, and I, I, I firmly believe that if we practice the things that are to follow in this morning's message and next week's message, then we will find our lives filled with happiness. Is it going to be easy? Absolutely not. But nothing worth having is ever easy, is it? We have to work for it. First thing I want us to see is to count your blessings, not your troubles. Count your blessings, not your troubles. There are far too many who look at life's problems, the woes, instead of their blessings. God says, give everything to me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. If you do this, if you do this, I will open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing until it overflows. See, God says, you do this. You give everything to me and you'll be blessed. And you know what? You won't just be blessed to where your cup is half full because there are going to be people who look at the cup as half empty. I'm not going to just sit there and bless you to where... It's right there at the brim. Now, I will bless you until it is overflowing. Overflowing. And you and I both know that he's not talking about material blessings. You know? Y'all should know by now that I am not a sow a seed, reap a seed preacher or anything like that. Right? Those blessings, they're going to overflow. There's a purpose for why these troubles are here. Maybe it's to draw you closer to God. Maybe that's why you might be going something. Maybe it's to allow you to experience something to help someone else. Right? There's a saying that some attributed to Helen Keller that says, I cried because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Right? Let's take that a step, step further. Nick Vichuicic. He was born without limbs. He's a speaker all over. He said, if God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet, then he will certainly use any willing heart. Now this is a guy... No arms, no feet. In fact, the, the one that is kind of, a, or no legs, the, the one that is, you can't see it in the picture, but he calls it his flipper. It's just at the bottom of his abdomen and just kind of flips out and, you know, he kind of messes with kids. He does, he does a lot of wonderful work. Public speaking works with kids and, and bullying and, and everything. But whatever tragedy you might be going through, God can use that. What you have to do is you, you have to stop for a moment and, and count your blessings and not your troubles. How can the situation that I am currently in bless someone else? Because let's be honest, 
as we tell our children, the world does not revolve around you, right? Not every blessing is for you either. Sometimes you're meant to be the blessing. Number two, live one day at a time. One day at a time. James, the brother of Christ, wrote in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or, or do that. Now that verse, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan out our retirement. It doesn't mean that we should stop looking for vacations. It, that's not what it's talking about. It's not saying we shouldn't that we should fail to set goals, but it does indicate that we shouldn't depend on those things. Yes, they are important, but in the end, they're not more important than knowing God. They're not more important than, than coming to the cross. On October 29th, 1929, Black Tuesday hit Wall Street. As investors, they traded around 16 billion shares. New York Stock Exchange, uh, you know, single day, largest shares ever sold. Billions of dollars were lost, wiping out thousands of investors. In the aftermath of what we know as Black Tuesday, America and the rest of the industrialized world, they spiraled downward into the Great Depression, which lasted for 10 years. The deepest and longest lasting economic downturn the Western world has ever seen. And what happened? Well, several who relied on extensive financial futures, they ended their lives because they couldn't cope in any way. Now, some people will say, and I'll tell you right now it's a myth, that when the stock exchange crashed, that there were hundreds of people just hurling themselves out of windows and everything else, and, you know, because of it, there were suicides, but history says that it wasn't really any more or less than anything else. But it did reach a point to where many clerks in downtown, uh, in hotels in downtown New York, when a guest wanted a room, they would actually ask, is it for sleeping or for jumping? There were some people who they were so set on their financial future. Yes, I'd like a room for a night. Okay. Are we going to have to make the bed or clean up the sidewalk? You know? Because they were so dependent on it. We can face most problems in life taking things one day at a time. You are here in the pews right now because you have survived 100% of everything life has thrown at you. You can survive more. Diamonds are formed and shaped when the heat is on and the pressure is high. Right? When you feel that way, when you feel that way, take it one day, one hour, one minute at a time if you have to, knowing that you will be of more value having come through it. When the heat is on and the pressure is high, you are being shaped into something for something. Number three, learn to say I love you. Learn to say I love you. It's real simple, right? Look at the gospel according to Mark, beginning in verse 3 of chapter 14. While he was in Bethany, talking about Christ, at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume and of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii. That's about 300 days wages, by the way. And the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. See, we need to break the alabaster jar and show kindness to as many people as we can as often as we can. 
You know, we take these words, I love you, and we frequently dole them out only to family, maybe close friends. But what about others? When's the last time, time you told someone, other than those two, other than family and friends, when is the last time you told someone that they were loved? Even a stranger. I want you to know that I love you. I want you to know that you are loved. Does it demean the word? Is that why we don't do it? No. Christ tells us, don't just love your spouses and your families. Love your enemies. Love your neighbors as yourself. Love the church. Telling someone that they are loved could make all the difference in their life. But you'll never know if you don't even try. You might be, you could be a stranger. You could walk up to a stranger and say, you know what? I just want you to know I love you. And you, a complete stranger, might be the only person to have ever said that to them. When even their family doesn't acknowledge them, you could make all the difference with three words. Learn to say, I love you. Well, I don't know them. I don't care if you know them. Christ didn't care if you, loved, if you knew them either. He said, love your enemies. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. And we've talked about it before. That word neighbor, it means the one who is nigh. That word nigh is the one who is close. The one who is close to you. Not just talking about, you know, your neighbor in where you live, but the one who is close to you. That might be a family member. But in 20 minutes, it might be the lady at, uh, you know, the Thai restaurant. Yeah, I said 20 minutes, oh, half an hour. I'm not preaching that long. But it may be your enemy. Christ, when he went around, he didn't sit there and differentiate between people. He said, you need help? I'll help you. I need you to know that I love you. Number four, seek to give, not to get. Seek to give, not to get. God will provide. And we need to have more faith in that. If you're not getting out of life what you want, it may be because you expect to get instead of give. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, gimme. That's the attitude that many of us have. You know... Oof. When I see Christians, and I've been that way too, I am not standing up here saying I am any better. I've gotten into the mindset of gimme, 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 gimme. Just ask my wife. That was supposed to be funny. Now gimme, gimme, gimme laugh. No. We, I think of the little kid following their, their mom in Walmart or something. You know, and they're just constantly kind of yanking on, on her shoulder. So, Mom, I want this. Mom, I want this. No, stop. Leave me alone. And then two aisles over, Mom, I want this. And then before Mom knows it, they actually took the toy or the candy or whatever from eight aisles over and have been carrying it with them the whole time. And they say, Mom, here's the empty wrapper. And then Mom gets to the counter. It's like, yeah, I guess I'm paying for this too. You know, sometimes I get that thought about Christians, the whole gimme, gimme, gimme attitude. Right? Seek to give, not to get. Luke 6.38, give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. You want to you get a lot? Give a lot. All right? You, you stingy with your time, you stingy with your love, you stingy with money, whatever it is. Okay. God can give it right back that way. Acts 20 and verse 35, In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must, must, not it's a choice, not if you feel like it, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. And He Himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Blessed, how happy 
right? I mean, we think back maybe to Psalm 1, and blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, stands in the way of the wicked, and all of this. Uh, we think uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, and this person is blessed. How happy is this person when they give? And we all experience, we, we've all experienced that at one time or another. Just doing a kindness for even a stranger. And seeing how much they, they light up and makes their day. At the end of the day, it's not about what you have or even what you've accomplished. At the end of the day, it's about who you've lifted up. Who you've made better. It's about what you've given. Number five, seek the good in everyone and everything. The last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, it begins with this discourse on judgment. I'm sure we're all familiar with it because we've probably all said this at one time or another, but it starts off, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Oh, there it is again. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, and behold, the log is in your eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, I'll tell you right now, we're not going to spend our time this morning talking about the standard of judgment that we're to use, uh, you know, and how it says don't judge and so we shouldn't judge, even though judgment is okay if we're using God's standard and, and what have you, and we can't really judge people for committing the same sin that we are. And, uh, you know, we're not really talking about that. and We're not addressing God's standard or... or as both biblical and necessary. Here's what I want us to see. Become a person who finds the good instead of the fault. Become a person who finds the good instead of the fault. Does that mean that we should ignore problems or fail to confront sin? No, absolutely not. But if the good is cultivated, then self-knowledge of the negative becomes more evident. And will often correct itself. Not all the time, but a lot of the time it will. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have someone, they're not, in a, Christ, they're not a Christian, okay? Not a Christian, they're in an adulterous relationship, right? Now, most of the time, what do we want to do? We want to attack the adultery first, right? As Christians, we say, okay, you're not a Christian, but you're in an adultery, adulterous relationship, so we attack the adultery first. Why? I mean, if they stop being an adulterer, but they're still not a Christian, who cares? Right? And I'm not saying who cares about the sin, and I'm not saying we shouldn't say anything. But what I'm saying is that if they corrected every single sin in their life, but they're still not a Christian, they're still not going to heaven. But if we focus on their spiritual state, if we focus on that... Right? and they become a Christian, then the more they learn about God, about Christ, about His Word, then eventually they will see that error and be confronted with it. They're, they, they're a Christian. They've been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, Acts 2.38. They've been added to the Lord's church, Acts 2.41 and 47. Now they're a Christian. They're confronted with the Word of God. What do you do? Because if they're not a Christian, then what they're doing in the grand scheme of things really doesn't make a difference as far as where their soul ends up. You're not the one who, who judges and condemns. The Word of God does that. That's why we're talking about that standard of judgment. I'm, I, I, you can't judge based off of opinion or past experience. You judge according to the Word of God. Seek the good, though, not the fault. Regarding the positive side of a situation, how might this apply? Reflect. 
Reflect if you have time. How might it draw you or another person closer to Christ? What biblical principles can you apply that will not only deepen your faith, but your understanding of God? And that comes to you. How well do you know the Word of God? I'm not saying that you need to memorize Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. I'm not saying that. But spend some time in the Word of God so that you know the principles of God's Word. So that you can talk to people about them. And if you don't have them from memory, that's fine. At least know where to find them. Number six, pray every day. Pray every day. Look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I'll give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. Just love the way, the way that words. I don't fear God, but this woman, she is annoying me. So I'm finally going to do it. As a side note, wives, that's kind of what your husband's thinking when you keep telling him to do something and he hasn't done it yet. I'll finally get to it. I'm going to be quiet because mine's, mine's looking at me now. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about His just, justice for His elect, those are Christians, those are born again, who cry to Him day and night, and He will delay long over them? I tell you that He will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? For His elect, again, the one who is born again, the Christian, who cry to Him day and night... See, we need to reserve time in our day to thank God for His blessings and ask for His guidance. I'll tell you right now, I may disagree with the Islamic faith. Okay, I do. Just to be clear, I do disagree with much of the Islamic faith. But the one thing I will not and cannot disagree with is their daily dedication to pray. Can't disagree with that. Five times a day, the devout will uh, unroll their sajada, that's their, their prayer rug. And the reason they're doing that is to create a clean space for prayer. And they kneel before sunrise, at noon, in the afternoon, at sunset, and at night. They fought long and hard for that to be accepted, so much that many companies today actually have separate rooms for them to go pray. Yet many Christians won't even pray over a meal. Or, or they'll go out to eat at a fast food restaurant. No, no, I, I just want to eat my french fries. I don't want anybody to see me talking to God. You kidding me? I mean, if you get a devout Muslim who is walking along the sidewalk when it's time to pray, if he's devout, you can bet he's going to drop that prayer rug and he's going to start praying. He doesn't care who's around. And in fact, if you've ever seen some of them, uh, how there's maybe kind of a brown spot right here on their foreheads, maybe you've seen people on the news or photos or, or what have you, the whole reason that's there is actually that, that shows how devout they are because they get on their knees and they press their head to the ground because they're coming before God. And the deeper and darker and more callous that spot is, it, you can tell how, how devoted to prayer they are. Because if you've got someone that's like that, you know they're praying all the time, probably more than five times a day. We must be devoted to our prayer life, unashamed of what others may think or what others may say. You know, we sit there a lot of the times, and I'm going to tell you right now, Christians, now this is not an extremist call, so don't take it that way. We need to be a little bit more militant with our faith. And when I say militant, I'm talking we need to be a little bit more unafraid. We need to be a lot more unafraid. 
we might sit there and say, you know what? <sighs> These Muslims got a special room to pray in. Well, why don't Christians have that? Because Christians don't make a big deal out of it. That's why. Oh, people are scared to sit there and say anything about Allah. They're not scared to say that. Why are they scared to say that? Because they know that a Muslim will stand up to it. They don't have a problem sitting there cursing God's name left and right on prime time. Why? Because Christians put up with it. You sit there and you burn a Koran or something, man, you might get yourself killed. You burn a Bible, pfft, I'll just go to the store and get another one, that's okay. We need to be more dedicated. We need to stop laying down like a bunch of bath mats and having people walk, walk their dirt all over us. Amen. That's the only way that people are going to take notice. And we need people to take notice because the more people that take notice, the more people that begin to understand our, uh, the faith. Not our faith, a faith, the faith, Peter says. The more people that understand the faith, the more people become Christians. The more people that become Christians, the more people that are on that narrow way. The more people on that narrow way, the more people get into heaven. The more people get into heaven, hey, guess what? You're doing your job. And when you're doing your job, don't sit there and pat yourself on the back. No. You say, as Christ said, we are but unworthy servants doing what we are told to do. Lastly, because I'm about to start a whole other sermon and we'll be here a long while. Lastly, number seven, do at least one good deed every day. At least, at least one. Don't be like a lot of people shooting for the minimum. Just do at least one. Luke records in Acts 10.38, you know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. He went about doing good. There are many things that you can do that are good for another person based upon their need. The good is not always what you think is good. Sometimes the good is what they actually need. For some, it might be as simple as listening to their troubles because no one else will. Y'all know that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth, right? He wants us to listen more than we talk. That's it for some people. I just want you to listen. I don't want your advice. I just want you to listen. It might be that simple for some people. For another, they may, may need help with grace. Whether buying them or or just knowing where to find some, or, or whatever. Others, they might need a ride to an appointment. The good that you can do is limitless if you're looking for it. We're too busy waiting on everyone else to do good. You know, we sit here and we wait on the government to make this better or that better, right? Uh, we, yet most of us will never, ever meet them I'm waiting for people 3,000 miles away to, to do something that's going to change my life. Never met them, never talked to them, don't even know their email address. Oh, come on, do something for me. We're waiting for someone else to do good. We rely on the law to do this or that. The reality is, if more people acted like Christ, we wouldn't need the government or the laws. Because everyone would be acting like Christ. And that also goes back to why we need to stand up about our faith. And we need to share our faith. Stop waiting for someone else to do the good. Count your blessings, not your troubles. Live one day at a time. Learn to say I love you. Seek to give, not to get. Seek the good in everyone, in everything. Pray every day. Do at least one good deed every day. If you start doing these things, and next week we're going to add another seven, but if you start doing these things, you will start to see a happy life. You have to remember that happy life it isn't based off the physical. 
I'm not saying you do these things and next thing you know, you know you're going to have a brand new car and house and million dollars in the bank. No. You'll have peace of mind though. You'll have a happy spirit. You'll be content. You'll be more at peace. Those things are a guarantee. Why? Because Christ said, if you do these things, I will bless you till it overflows. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a member of the Lord's body. This might be the first time that you have stepped into a place of worship and heard the word of God. It's okay if it's the first time here. I'm glad that you're here. Don't let it be the last. You might be wondering, well, well, where do I start? Because you were talking about these sins that I might have in my life, but you said if I'm not a Christian, it doesn't matter. So, so where do I start? Start by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the testimony of Christ. You believe that Word. After Peter was done preaching in Acts chapter 2, they said, men and brethren, what do we need to do? He said, repent and be baptized. That is, immersed every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins. 1 Peter 3.21, because baptism now saves you. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, and you want to know how to come under the shadow of the cross, to be covered by the blood of the Lamb, repent of that life. When I say repent, it's a change of mind that results in a change of heart and a change of action. You need to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You don't have to, you don't have to sit there and list out all your troubles. If I listed out all my sins just for the past week, we'd be here all night. We are all of sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Not one of us is perfect, but we are in the process of being perfected. So you're baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You raise up as a new creation and you walk in a newness of life, being faithful unto death. Revelation 2 and verse 10 says that you might receive that victor's crown. Maybe you are a member of the Lord's body and you've just been struggling. Maybe you're in a downward spiral and depressions hit you and you're not sure where to turn. Maybe it's been so long that you've had a happy life. And you need the prayers of the congregation will pray with you and for you under the throne of God. Maybe you just need to talk to someone. And it doesn't have to be me. Anyone here is willing to listen. And do what we can, where we can with what we have. In a moment we're going to sing a hymn of invitation, but I want you to know, because this is important, the Lord's invitation is always open. That door is never closed if you are willing. If there is anything at all that we could do, we would ask that you make that known by coming forward as together we stand and sing our praises.